to get uh, with uh, some of the technical issues. Um, we will be recording uh, tonight's uh, event. So um, for those of you uh, who weren't able to, uh, to see it uh, live the first time around, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy catching up. So again, I'm Larry Rickman, editor and co-founder of the Colorado Sun. Uh, just want to welcome you to Misinformation versus the Machine, Foundations of News Literacy. This is the first of three events designed to help teachers, students, and others become well-informed news consumers and to help distinguish fact from fiction. The event is a collaboration between the News Literacy Project and the Colorado Sun. I want to thank our sponsors, the Colorado Education Association, for sponsoring tonight's, tonight's event, as well as the next two events in April and May. I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. Looking forward to a lively, informative discussion. And I want to remind our viewers that we hope to hear from you too. You can send questions to questions at coloradosun.com. We'll do our best to address as many as we can uh, during our hour long discussion. And um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to introduce the members of our panel. Uh, Chuck Plunkett is an award-winning journalist, uh, has been an award-winning journalist for two decades. He directs the University of Colorado Boulder's capstone program, CU News Corps. Prior to joining the university, he served as editorial page editor at the Denver Post, where he also previously served as politics editor. Dr. Rachel Lieberman is a teaching associate professor of media studies in the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies at the University of Denver. She teaches courses such as Introduction to Media and Culture, Identity, Power, and Media Culture, and Media and Marketplace Feminism. And Liz Price is Manager of Professional Learning at the News Literacy Project. Prior to that, she worked as a program manager at the self-driving vehicle company Cruise and was a co-advocacy lead for Empowering Women of Cruise. So I just want to get us kind of started here. This is a big topic. I mean, books can be written about this issue, and, and we're going to try to dig into this and, and help get you some information and some tools over the course of the, of the next hour. The Washington Post tells its readers on its front page every day that democracy dies in darkness. But again, as the editor of the Colorado Sun, I would tell you it also thrives in the sunlight. Free press is a pillar of a healthy democracy. Misinformation and disinformation escalate during elections. We see Vladimir Putin in Russia targeting press freedoms and shutting down independent news organizations. He understands, he and other authoritarians understand all too well the power of a free press. Now, once upon a time, Americans largely watched the same national news broadcasts and more or less could at least agree on the facts, if not the interpretation of those facts. Today, you know, we have a, a fire hose of information that's that's aimed at all of us online, on TV, 24-7 uh, TV uh, cable channels and whatnot. It's never been easier to find information from a wide variety of sources. But some of it's factual, some of it's blatantly partisan and false, some of it's quite valid news. Uh, cable TV stations have high profile news uh, hosts uh, or high profile hosts at least who review the news every night, but even their own lawyers have said some of them are more entertainment than news. I'm hoping we can dig into some of these tools to help you and your students uh, determine fact from fiction, news from entertainment. I just want to state up front, our goal is not to tell you which sources to use, but to help you and your students make your own decisions. I'm going to start off uh, with you, Liz. Can you tell us about the News Literacy Project and why this is something uh, teachers should prioritize? Thank you, Larry, and thanks for having me. Um, so yes, as you mentioned, I am a member of the News Literacy Project. I'm its uh, manager of professional learning. And the News Literacy Project is a nonpartisan national education nonprofit. And we essentially teach uh, educators and the general public on how to um, determine the credibility of news and other information that we, that we consume and that we share. So we uh, share different programs and different resources um, for educators and for the public. And our, our mission is, is really to create news literacy for everybody, whether you are um, an educator, whether you are a student, or whether you are a member of the general public, we want people to be able to understand uh, what it means to um, access 
credible news sources and to be able to determine between what is credible and what is not. Um, I, I also want to just talk a little bit about our um, educator resources, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause and we'll do that a little bit later, but just going to put that plug in right now. All right, sounds good. Thank you. And by the way, uh, just another uh, reminder here to everyone, uh, if you have questions, uh, please send them to questions at coloradosun.com and, and we'll do our best to, to get them addressed. But Chuck, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to you next. Uh, you're a former uh, politics editor at the Denver Post. You've been a reporter, a journalist, you know, who played it straight down the middle. You also have been uh, editorial page editor of uh, what at that point was Colorado's uh, largest newspaper. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, uh, so much of so much of what we see can be opinion that masquerades as news. How do you tell the difference? And you know, just as a news consumer, how do you uh, how do you distinguish fact from from opinion? It's a great question, um, and it's one that I'm glad that that educators are going to think more about and talk more about with their students. Um, as, now that when you know when I was in the newsroom, it was very clear to us when you're inside a newsroom, a traditional newsroom. You see it. There are boundaries. There is the, the 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 desk where all the reporters are and the editors, and they're chasing the news from all different kinds of levels. And then there's the editorial department, the opinion page. Um, it's separate from the newsroom physically. Uh, we're not intermingled. Um, there's a firewall uh, in theory uh, that we all respect, so that even when we are all moving about in in the building together and talking and what have you, we still honor that there's a firewall. Uh, a news editor can't come to an opinion editor and say, hey, could you guys, the mayor's given us a hard time with this story we're working on. Could you really rip him apart in an editorial? No, no, we're not going to do that. You can't tell us what to do. You can't tell us how to run our pages. Could we say, hey, we're writing an editorial about the mayor. Could you guys dial up a, a real good hit, a hit piece on him so that we could, you know, really hit him hard in our editorial? That's completely out of bounds. That breaks all kinds of rules of journalistic ethics and, and, and what have you. We, tr we honor that constantly when we're in the newsroom. And it seems very, very straightforward. When we bring in visitors, they get it right away. They see, okay, here's the news department, here's the opinion department. Uh, the news people do news, the opinion people do opinion. When you look at old school newspapers, it's very clear. The news is in one section. The opinion page is clearly identified in its own section, sometimes at the back of a section, but it's across the top of the masthead. You see that it's editorial page and opinion op-ed columnists, letters to the editors, editorial cartoons, all those kinds of things. Visually, there's a huge separation between opinion uh, and news. Now on digital sites uh, at places like the Colorado Sun that also have opinion writers, they clearly identify their opinion writers as opinion contributors or opinion writers. Um, and it tends to also be on its own special tab within the overall ecosystem of the website. So sometimes I just got the feeling of everybody understands how that works. But when I left the Denver Post and joined uh, older um, with journalism students, young people who, who are majoring in journalism, when they take opinion writing classes with me, I ask at the beginning of the semester, how many of them are familiar with how an editorial board works and how opinion pages work and how there's a separation between opinion and the news. And, and it's surprising how many of them aren't really that up to speed about the difference and how that has to be a, a critical part of the early training of our opinion writers. So the way that I differentiate Larry is by, by looking for the kinds of cues that, that I just mentioned, that you guys provide at the Colorado Sun, for example, clear indications that say, this is opinion, this is an opinion writer, this is a columnist, this is an editorial, this is a letter to the editor, um, something along those lines. There are news sites that now tr present what looks like a news article, but it's clearly slanted. Uh, to serve some particular purpose. I suspect we're going to get into more of that as we move along, so I'll step down from that. But when you talk about of writing versus news copy, those are the distinctions that we look for. Thank you. So, Rachel, I mean, you, um, of course, like Chuck, you know, you're dealing with, uh, with university uh, students as well. I mean, honestly, 
it, it's something that everybody struggles with. I mean, at the Colorado Sun, just to, to state, I mean, we don't have, we don't do house editorials, you know, as, as, um, as we used to say, the voice of God, right? We don't tell readers what to think or who to vote for. We don't endorse candidates and all of that. But we do feel like it's part of our mission to share opinions from a variety of different uh, viewpoints across Colorado. We label everything opinion, and we, you know, have a disclaimer on there that says this is the opinion of the of the author, not of the Colorado Sun, et cetera. I get more angry emails about opinion columns than I do about everything else combined. So it's really hard for people to 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 tell the difference, but. Also difficult, I think, for people to to just try to figure out is this a is this a credible news source? I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about that and how you think about it and and how you might be able to help uh, students, but also help teachers who are trying to help students uh, dig into this issue. Thanks, and it's great to be here. So thanks for including me on this wonderful panel. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of not necessarily pushback, but there are a lot of there are a lot of feelings around what is credible and what isn't. And a lot of my students come into the classroom with um, strong alliances and an allegiance to particular sources. And often that comes from family too, right? So you know, my parents, um, you know, this was in the background, and this is what I feel is important to me. And so as an as an educator you know, what I do is I honor that, right? Okay, great. Okay, so what did you learn from that? Or what did you like or dislike about that source that you grew up with? Um, I grew up with uh, Rush Limbaugh in the background. Um, and so, you know, we all come from different um, experiences in that way. So when I get to the conversation of what is credible and what is not, it's always really tricky because you don't want to necessarily um, denounce a source that they've looked to for the for most of their lives, right? So the conversation is more about, okay, well, how can we nuance or bring in new sources to diversify the information that you are already receiving? So you start with what they have and then you kind of build on that, right? And when I think about credibility and when I talk about that with students, um, you know, simple things like look at their about us page. Is there clear, transparent information about who is generating this information? Um, you know, do you see icons for like private donors that look very partisan? You know, that's a clue, right? Um, but again, credibility is built by understanding who is creating the source. Um, and then you have to dig around with um, or creating the, the news um, and information. But, you know, when I talk to students about credibility, there's there's a lot, right? Um, you know, uh, is it uh, what kind of domain name is it if it's online? Um, who who is who is writing? Who um, how are they um, aligned economically with conglomerates? Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting questions you can ask about credibility. But for me, one of the main questions is: Can you identify who is creating this source? Right, this this information source, and what can you learn about those writers? And it doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, resources. That's one other thing I want to add is, you know, if some if a website looks clunky, but the information is excellent, that's, it's fine. It doesn't have to be shiny, right? But, you know, I think that there's a lot of community-based um, media resources that are fantastic. So, you go again, so in part of this calculus, it's okay um, not to, you know, it's important to kind of set aside some of those visual expectations in our digital world. It's okay, who is producing it? Um, what affiliations do they have with other companies? Um, so I guess, it, I guess it's hard to answer that question, even though it should be pretty easy. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I say to people sometimes is, you know, uh, do they acknowledge when they get it wrong? I mean, we're all humans and uh, we all make mistakes. Is this a site that, uh, that acknowledges that they got it wrong and that they are, are trying to set the record straight? To me, that's a, that's a big indicator of, of whether this is someone who's trying to be taken seriously or whether they're partisan. So we have, a, we have our first question uh, from a viewer, Michael. Uh, and I'm just gonna open this up to whoever wants to, to tackle this and you can all fight over it. Are the terms fact and truth too controversial now? Are terms like credible and valid more appropriate uh, or effective? Does anybody wanna tackle that? I, I still like the words facts and truth and think it would be a sad day if 
if we jettison them. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Liz, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I agree um, with Chuck. I think that when we talk about um, this, this concept of like standards-based journalism, what we're really talking about is, is fact-based journalism. And I think if you're removing that word, then it really takes away the, the true meaning of, of when we're striving to, to find credible news sources. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, with saying fact or truth. So, you know, one of the things that we try to do at the Colorado Sun and, and other news organizations do this is that, you know, we understand that people want to know, how do you know what you say you know? How do I know that's a fact? And, you know, we say on our site, you know, like we were there, or uh, if we cite a report, we include a link to it so that people can go and read the report themselves so they have access to those, to those primary sources. Are there other things that, uh, that people can do to try to, um, you know, to try to, to determine whether uh, this is fact or, or something else? Any other suggestions? Or I know that the, the Literacy Project has uh, tools and tips and, and we'll, we'll get to some of that, but maybe you can share a couple of thoughts about that, Liz. Absolutely. Yeah. So as you mentioned, we, you know, we have a lot of resources and that's kind of our wheelhouse is offering these, these re resources for educators and for students and for the public. Um, one of the resources that I'll just briefly platform is our Checkology virtual classroom. And this is an amazing resource, um, especially for educators, but really for everyone. And we have several different modules within the Checkology virtual classroom that focus specifically on um, identifying the credibility of a news source and like genuine steps that you can take to really do that. So it really breaks it down um, in kind of easy to digest uh, ways. So that's one resource that I, I would I want to just highlight because I think it, um, you know, there's sometimes there is this kind of mysticism about well, how do I do this and what tools am I supposed to use? Um, and I think that's a really good tool to use. And I also just wanted to um, briefly go back to something that Rachel mentioned about um, visual credibility and sites maybe that seem clunky, but they actually have good information. Um, that's a really important point. And there are sites out there that, uh, especially what comes to mind uh, right now is Snopes. Um, Snopes is a, a very popular fact-checking website and it kind of has an older interface and there's lots of ads and it can be a little clunky, but it's really one of the most credible like fact-checking sites out there. And so there are other sites like Snopes that um, might have, you know, more of a, um, difficult to use interface or just something that might not be as visually appealing as, as newer, more popular sites. But um, those sources are still really important to kind of understand and take the time to really sanitize and look through um, because they, they can be really useful resources. Rachel, you touched on this a little bit earlier, you know, that we all, you know, whether we intend to or not, sometimes surround ourselves with a bubble, you know, where we you know, interact with people who agree with us and, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we just wind up in our own bubbles or echo chambers or whatnot, you know, as a, as to be a savvy news consumer, um, we need to bust out of those. How, how would you encourage someone to do that? So one, like a starting point would be to identify the bubble, right? So figure out what your bubble is. Um, review your, you know, who are you following on your socials? Um, what type of information do you, like, so do an audit, right? Like just take some time to see, okay, what information am I getting? Usually you can, you kind of know, right? What your, um, what ideologies or, you know, particular ideas you see most. And then, you know, try to, uh, you know, burst that bubble, so to speak, by um, including sources that may look a little different uh, in terms of ideology or political leanings. Or again, I I always encourage my students to get out of their bubble because you will learn more and you will also strengthen um, the way you can articulate the way you feel about things or, you know, and maybe it will help you question what you held so dear, right, um, in, in, in your consciousness. So I feel that you know, recognizing what your bubble is, and then, you know, maybe selecting three sources that you would otherwise not go to naturally, and just kind of try to 
incorporate them in your roundup of news and information. I, I say to some to people sometimes, you know, when they're talking about uh, cable news or whatever, I'm like, look, if you're an MSNBC person, go watch Fox. You know, maybe it'll make you mad. Go watch something that makes you mad. Uh, or if you're a Fox viewer, you know, watch CNN or MSNBC or whatever it might be. If you're a Wall Street Journal person, go read the New York Times or whatever it might be. There are lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, I, I do think it's important sometimes to get mad, you know, <laughs> and to be presented with other points of views. It's not always a great business model for me uh, at the Colorado Sun to, as I said, with opinion columns, I feel like it is important for us to sometimes get people mad and, and present them, you know, with differing points of view just to get them thinking. Um, uh, one thing, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, I just had one more thought to that. And in, in that information, that audit or, you know, review of your information bubble, it's also important to, to look at the writers that you are learning from. Um, are they all white? Are they all men? Um, are they all part of a certain part of the country, right? So it's, it's really key to um, just a, not only by content, but also uh, journalists and voices. So that's another part of kind of getting out of that bubble as well. That's a great point. I've got another, the questions from uh, viewers are just pouring in. So thank you to everyone. Uh, question from attendee Don, isn't an important question, who decides what news you see? Um, I've got my own answers to that, but Chuck, maybe you want to tackle that one. Yeah, um, that's a great question. We Back in the day when I was first starting out before the rise of the popular internet, um, we, we had this kind of idea that it's not news until we say it's news. So it, I mean, literally, that was how we ran the newsroom. We were a filter. That was our job. That's not such a crazy idea. It's just like you're, we think of our jobs when we're reporting the news in, in a way that we're trying to break things down and make things easily comprehensible for people who have busy, active lives. You've, you've, got, you've got school, you've got work, you've got soccer practice, you've got piano lessons, you gotta buy groceries, you gotta do all this stuff and there's all this news flying all around. It's our job in the newsroom to bust it down and make it straightforward and, and digestible. So if there's a complex story about uh, a state policy that's before the legislature, uh, our job is to bust out all the talking points, put it in plain English, run the numbers on how much it's going to cost, what's going to come out of your pocketbook, those kinds of things, so that you quickly get the importance of the news. So when it comes to something like there's a rumor banging around town about some prominent official uh, who may or may not be involved in something nefarious, do you rush to print with something like that? Well, rumors are circulating that so-and-so is involved in such and such. Well, no, you don't do that. That's just, that's journalistic malpractice. You have to dig in, you have to do the reporting, you have to find out if it's true uh, and if it's that word again. And if it's not, if the facts don't support uh, those rumors and those allegations, then your question is, do you write about it at all? Do you acknowledge it? Do you give it any kind of oxygen or do you just let it, just let it wither? Those things are harder to do now. Those decisions are harder to make now because if you don't, if you don't have something on your news site about what everyone's talking about, People start flaming you on social media and uh, making your life miserable until you do. And it becomes harder and harder for newsrooms to stand by those, that old adage. And then we, we begin to question, well, should we be the filter? Shouldn't we just go ahead and acknowledge the fact that, well, there, is, there are these rumors, but to the best that we can tell, they're not true. Uh, we, we can't find any facts that support, an art, support this news story. So uh, that, that would be my answer to that question. You know, I, I will just share a very quick story. Uh, Chuck, as you know, uh, back in 2000, during the presidential election, uh, I was assistant managing editor for Associated Press, the world's largest news organization. I got sent to Florida to uh, to oversee AP's coverage of the Bush-Gore um, election recount and the, and the situation in Florida. It was just a big mess. Some of the major networks called the race initially uh, for Bush and Associated Press, uh, we did not. We said the race was too close to call and we were under tremendous pressure. I mean, you cannot imagine the pressure that we were under, like just call the race already. You guys are in you know, Gore's pocket or you know, whatever it is. And we're like, you know, look, we're, we'll call the race when we feel confident we can call the race. And it, you know, it, it really 
was seen as partisan by some, but you know, to to your point, Chuck, you know, we we weren't ready to call it. We didn't call it until you know it was weeks later before we called it, and there was a, you know, frankly, Gore was on his way to concede to Bush on uh, on election night because so many others were calling the race uh, for Bush, he actually turned his motorcade around because Associated Press was not calling the race. And it was the right decision to make. It's hard sometimes to make these editorial decisions uh, as journalists, but you know, we, we, we do have a responsibility to you know, hold back, uh, to, to not rush to, uh, to print or to online in today's version. Uh, with facts that just aren't quite yet verified, whether it's rumor or it's, you know, uh, in, in that case, the results of an election. So I'm going to go to another question here. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit, but uh, from, from Marilyn, do you think the lines between opinion and news are becoming blurred? I see more charged words in news stories these days, even in national publications I respect. Anybody want to tackle that one? I see that too, and it's worrisome. And so I have to take it on a case by case basis, whether the reporter uh, and, the, and the news organization cross the line. But there is an effort in this, in this age of rich information to try to call something as accurately as you can. And sometimes modifiers that we normally wouldn't use when we think about traditional journalism 101 are effective and are handy. Um, but it's always, it always makes me nervous when I start to see, um, charged words and that kind of thing. It's hard to answer broadly what that means without having a specific example, because again, I think you have to take it on a case by case basis. We've got another question, uh, from, uh, Suzanne, what is appropriate to do when someone wants you to report their alternative facts, which some of us call lies? Where does free speech end when dealing with facts versus fakes? When do you say no, even if it's from the White House? And if you don't say no to them, then why not? That comes back to it's not news until we say it's news. Um, it, and it comes back again to it's a case by case basis. But if, if you know that something's a lie, you can just call it a lie straight up and point to the facts, be very transparent about how you reach that conclusion, why you're able to say that. Um, if it's so egregious that just repeating it would give oxygen to something that could do great damage, then ethically the right thing to do is not to repeat it. Uh, to paraphrase it or to couch it or to describe it in such a vague term that you're not repeating the error. Just like when you make a correction, if you're a good news organization, you don't repeat the error, you just correct the error. Um, would be the way that to hand the, would be the mental calculus that you would go through on that. And I'll toss out real fast Rachel's uh, idea to know that a new site is credible to look at the about page and to look at the people who are behind it and uh, what their operating strategy are. Another great that's a fantastic idea, and you should always do it. it when in doubt, always click that. Another great tool that this, this should be near that same button is like the Colorado Sun has and the Denver Post has and Colorado Public, any, any uh, credible newsroom has, they post their ethics policy that the newsroom is bound to follow or face discipline uh, all the way up to, to firing uh, online and make it public so that the public has full access to what guides the ethical decision making uh, from all kinds of edi editorial considerations from opinion writing to fact gathering to um, even use of social media, all the way down to sit, dictating what a newsroom employee can or cannot do when it comes to donating to political causes, joining political causes, putting political signs in your yard and all that. Uh, for example, a lot, of, a lot of newsrooms don't allow it. They say, you, if you're gonna be a defender of, this, of the First Amendment, you have to sacrifice some of your First Amendment rights uh, and, and play it more neutral. You know, Chuck, I, I think you make a, a great point about you know, it isn't news till we decide it's news. I mean, that is sort of the classic, you know, uh, editor's position in a newsroom. I, I would say, you know, from a, a reader's perspective, that it it underscores the importance of having uh, diversity when it comes to your news sources. You know, once upon a time, you know, when I was growing up, 
you know, everybody kind of read the same newspaper or maybe a couple of newspapers. And, you know, they more or less agreed on the facts and you could, you know, go to the newspaper and it would be like going to King Supers or something. You, you, you get all your, all the food you need for your, your, for your evening meal under one roof, you know, but today, I think in today's media uh, environment, it's, it's kind of more like, um, you know, you've heard me use this analogy, analogy before, more like my old neighborhood in Brooklyn, where, you know, if you want really good uh, bread, you went to the bread store, you want really good meat, you go to the butcher, you want really good cheese, you go there. And, and it's more work, frankly, uh, it is more work for consumers today, to news consumers to really um, put together their, I don't want to say bubble, but <laughs> to put together the, to, to put together news sources to, to become well informed, you know, it, it can be a lot of work. And, uh, and I guess we're, what we're all saying, I think, is that, look, our society, our very democracy depends on us being well informed. And that, I mean, this is why the founders, you know, put protections for a free press in the very first amendment to the Constitution. I mean, Thomas Jefferson got beat up pretty bad back in the day uh, by newspapers, which printed a lot of scurrilous, some of it true, by the way, and some of it uh, fiction. But, uh, you know, there's the famous quote from, from Thomas Jefferson about if he had to, had to choose between a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, you know, he would choose the latter. And there was a reason for that. It was not because he was a big fan of newspapers, that he just understood that there was this marketplace of ideas where, you know, hopefully the truth would, would, rise, to the, would rise to the surface. So, I mean, on the one hand, it might be scary from a reader's perspective to hear a journalist say, well, I decide when it's news and you just have to accept it. Well, may, at that news site, maybe so, but um, you've got choices as a consumer. It's never been easier to go find others. Um, Rachel, did you have anything else that you'd like to add on that on that question? Yeah, no, um, just to, to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, um, I, I let my students know the sources that I go to, and um, and I always say I I do my best to read as much as I can. But um, at a at a certain point, I have to pivot to grading or other elements of my life. But I think that you know when I talk to my students about not necessarily the duty, but just like you know harness the intellectual curiosity that is behind reading newspapers and listening to podcasts. And this is, it, it's more about really trying to break apart narratives that are assumed about the world we live in and just, you know, read and, and learn from different places. And, and while it is work, right. And while it, it definitely takes away from other things you could be doing, it's, it just, uh, it, it makes your life rich and um, you are, uh, it make for me at least, and the students that I talk to about this. Once they start reading more and more, they start to know, like you were saying, which sources to go to for opinion, right? Um, so it's all about, um, you know. Again, it's funny that you say it's work because uh, it is to a certain extent. But once you start getting into it, I think a, a lot of uh, my students think it's very fun to start really getting into the news, right? Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate that you were kind of chatting about that because um, we consumers are asked to do a lot now. So it's it's worth kind of thinking about. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead, Liz. Oh, sorry. I just I just wanted to add on that. Um, I think that the one good thing to kind of think about is like when we're looking for sources, you know, this is an opportunity for us to, to really learn something. And it's an opportunity, like you won't learn unless you are putting yourself in the situations to learn, right? And I think there's a difference between um, selectively like curating the sources you read and then also versus being open to all kinds of different sources. And I think there's an important distinction to be made there. And one, one uh, thing that I, we've talked about before at, at the News Literacy Project is um, news aggregates and how those can be really useful tools to bring you content that you might not normally um, look for because you, you just wouldn't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? So aggregates are kind of a, a good way to um, get 
different pieces of news from all over the place. And then by doing that, you get used to seeing things that you, you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And that kind of builds your appetite for going through different kinds of sources. So um, just wanted to add that. Yeah, and you know, I, I've shared this story before, but you know, in, in talking to a college class you know, a while back, you know, I asked the students, you know, where do you guys get your news? And, you know, people just sort of shrugged and said, from my news feed, and they didn't really know where it came from. And then they kind of said, well, you know, news is just a downer. It's depressing. And, and, uh, and, you know, I, my message is, look, uh, you know, it's sort of like saying you don't like food, because all you've ever eaten is fast food, you know, you should be more deliberate about going out and finding credible sources of news and, you know, making up your own mind, exposing yourself to different points of view and that sort of thing. We've got a question here. Um, gosh, I think her name is Elizabeth. Yes. I'm an education, uh, an elementary education major. Can I, should I challenge the news sources that my future students consume, especially outside of my classroom, such as in their homes? I definitely want to build their critical thinking and news literacy skills. I think you touched on this a little bit, Rachel, but is there anything else you or or Liz or Chuck that you want to say on that question? I think, so it, it's interesting. I, um, when I just hear the word challenge, right? Um, I think I think that uh, there have been times and moments where I, I've pushed back a little or pushed on you know, or asked students to kind of explore and discuss the strengths of the source, right? So what is, um, and I think that co comparing that source with another, but still respecting the, the, the student's interest, right? But offering a comparison, um, creating some type of exercise where they read an article or, or some a news item from the source that you want to kind of challenge and then another source or other sources, right? So there are ways that you can incorporate um, or, or bring in some type of active learning moment to help them think it through themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Um, so um, again, uh, I think Liz had, did you oh, unmute? Oh, yeah, I, oh, I was go just ahead, gonna, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think it's important to avoid telling students you should look at this source or you should not look at this source like I think that is that is what we want to avoid we do want to encourage students to understand how to identify what a source is saying and who is behind that source and and in doing so being able to compare the differences between different sources so um, yeah, I, I think maybe that that word challenge, we can consider it not challenging, but um, providing another resource or providing a way to understand the news landscape versus source A, source B, source C as kind of individual things in a vacuum, right? So uh, we've got a couple of other questions here, but this sort of this one kind of popped into my head. I mean, we we've already touched on you know how even students in college, even college journalism majors, don't know a lot about news literacy, and you know maybe have their own uh, blind spots or whatnot. How how far how early do we begin with this process? You know, is it middle school, high school? I mean. I had a government teacher in high school who used to throw darts at a dartboard. And if he happened to hit you, you know, eat your number, he was going to ask you a question about that morning's newspaper. And it was designed to get you to read the the, the daily newspaper. Um, not sure you can do that anymore. <laughs> Probably wouldn't allow darts in a classroom today. But uh, when do we begin this process and, and how do you, how do you do it? How do you, can you have these kinds of conversations with middle school students and should, should we? I remember in ninth grade, uh, a, cl a class that we read newspapers for the first part of class. It was a civics class. Uh, and it was, we, they, the class, the school had a relationship with the local papers uh, and they delivered a stack of them. And so we would start the day reading the local news and then have conversations about it. That was ninth grade and it seemed, it seemed pretty accessible. It was a really great learning tool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that it would be prohibitive at the, at the eighth or seventh grade level. 
Um, we try to write, we, we, we say in newsrooms, we try to write to a, a seventh grade level sometimes. I don't think we always really pay attention to that, but um, get them started early, the earlier the better, uh, in my opinion. Liz, yeah, you touch on it? I, I agree. Um, actually, you know, the resources that we build at NLP are designed primarily for middle school and high school students, but we have resources for students as young as elementary school age. And I think that there's a lot that you can do with young, with young students who are exposed to this, to misinformation online and, and are exposed to, to content more and more online. So um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe some of the more advanced uh, concepts like, you know, maybe like lateral reading or something might not be appropriate for an elementary school student, but um, younger kids can absorb all kinds of information. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, I don't think we have to water it down necessarily for them. So, and, oh, sorry. Sure. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I just want to interrupt you. I just wanted to add that um, even just one thing too is even modeling kind of accessing news and information for uh, younger children, you know, before they're reading, right? So um, I have a two-year-old and he sees me with the New Yorker or kind of looking at news and just, you know what I mean? Like just kind of getting it into the, the mix of, of things that are going on. And then one thing I was going to add too is that I do a, a project for my undergrads. It's a media watch project. It's kind of related to, I used to intern for FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting in New York. And um, so this kind of watchdog kind of idea. So I have them all um, break up into teams and they follow, this might also be in your resources list. So I'm sorry if it's kind of um, the same thing, but um, I have them break up into teams and they follow like, you know, the, the, the Sun actually was in the, in the list, the Sun, Denver Post, uh, you know, Boston Globe, whatever, and they follow a particular subject. And then they all report out, okay, here's what the report was today, right? So you can dial that all the way down to middle school, you know, and of course, we'll talk, we'll talk about framing and agenda setting in the undergraduate classroom. But you can just say like, oh, this source spoke, or this is how they talked about, so you can just get them to start thinking critically about coverage, just by getting into that team kind of watchdog. Uh, style. So and it could be kind of fun for them. Great. Thank you. Liz, we have a question uh, from attendee Amy. Hello from Atlanta. Hey, Atlanta. Uh, social media sites can learn a user's religious preferences and target content accordingly. Do you think there are ways to successfully engage people of faith in conversations about news literacy, given that some people may not be willing to acknowledge a difference between facts and beliefs? That's a great question. Um, so I will just talk about a model that we use at the News Literacy Project that was developed by my colleague, John Silva. And um, it's called the PEP model. And it, PEP stands for Patience, Empathy, and Persistence. And essentially, when you're talking with someone who has a different belief than you do, the the um, attitude that you wanna enter in when you're talking with them is one that is non-hostile, right? And one that is um, accepting that this other person has a different opinion or has a different um, baseline perspective than you. And it's, it's not about you know, convincing them that you are right and they are wrong or that their, their opinion has you know, no merit. It's really about um, kind of getting them to see that there are other ways to absorb and understand information and then letting them kind of take that and do that, do with that what they, what they will, right? So um, yeah, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I, I think that there's something important to be said about kind of that, that first element in that model of, of really, well, really all the elements, but like the patients and the the empathy part, right? And, and understanding that, you know, people are going to have different belief systems, they're going to have different backgrounds, they're going to be coming from all different walks of life. How can you create a, um, a kind of level playing field when having a conversation with them without trying to convince them like, hey, you're, you're just wrong, you know? And, and even if they might have 
Um, their sources may not be truly based in fact, you know, that's not necessarily a reason to um, immediately condemn them because really then they're, they're just going to double down. They're going to be like, well, I'm, I'm right. And I don't really, I don't care what you have to say. Right. So um, yeah, I, I hope that that sort of touches on your question. Great. Thank you. I'm wondering, you know, uh, where do where do we want to send? Uh, I mean, like without you know talking about specific sites necessarily. I mean, where where do teachers go? Where do students go to get their news? You know, can you be a well informed citizen by you know using TikTok or Instagram or you know do you have to go to NewYorkTimes.com or uh, whatever it is? I mean, are are there uh, are are there where, 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 should, where should people start, you know, if they really want to be informed? And I, I want to throw one other thing out there, and this is sort of two questions, multi-part question here. Um, what about paywalls? You know, again, some of the major publications, we don't have a paywall at the Colorado Sun, which paywall is, again, where uh, if you come to a site uh, and uh, if you're not a member or a subscriber, you have to pay to read it or... Um, you, you might get five free stories in a month and then you have to start paying or, you know, that sort of thing. We don't have a paywall at the Colorado Sun, but a lot of news organizations do. Um, how do we help teachers and, and students uh, navigate that? So uh, again, I threw out a couple of questions, um, hoping you guys can, can jump on that, maybe each one of you. Rachel, I'll start with you. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the way I'll, I'll start with the, you know, thinking about TikTok and, you know, I, New York Times or nytimes.com, right? So I like to think of all these sources um, in a very intertextual way. And I find that there are conversations happening um, across all of these platforms and spaces. Um, and, you know, when I'm in a classroom, I don't denounce social media when students are like, oh, I, you know, this is where I get my news and information. Um, but I always then, you know, open up a larger discussion about, you know, critical thinking and credibility, right? So it, you know, um, and often let's not forget that many um, of our, you know, national newspapers will create stories based on a Twitter post, right? So it's, it, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a synergy there that's happening. Um, I think it's interesting to think about kind of a hierarchy of news organizations where it's like, of course, you know, New York Times is up on the top and then TikTok is on the bottom or, or you know, Twitter or Facebook's probably on the bottom or sorry, I shouldn't say that out loud. But um, I, think, I think that, um, you know, I think that there's a way you can have really rich conversations about how they work together in this very digital uh, world we live in. And it can open up opportunities to, to talk about, again, critical thinking, credibility. Um, I will say that uh, in terms of paywalls, you know, is it tough for um, students? I mean, here's the thing. I think that journalists need to be paid, right? And I think that news organizations, it's very important, um, but I know that uh, Colorado Sun and I forget there's a there's an organization in Texas, I forget his name. The Texas Tribune. Yeah, right, and I know that you modeled after, or you, you know, and, and so there are ways we can play with the the paywall, but I don't necessarily think that it's awful, while at the same time I recognize it can be prohibitive for um, some who can't afford um, to pay for it. So, you know, that's my response for now. <laughs> Liz, do you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, you know, I think as far as paywalls go, um, it's really about finding a variety of sources, right? And we've kind of touched on that earlier in the conversation. So um, if there are sources that are behind a paywall that you want to read and that you want to subscribe to, you know, maybe you pick one out of out of 10, right? Um, and maybe that's not realistic. So maybe you find sources that don't have a paywall that are in at least standards based news sources, right? And I guess this kind of ties in with the other question about like social media. Um, platforms. Um, I think it's, it is um, part of our, our information ecosystem, like they cannot be extricated from the system now, right? So it's really about finding that 
um, per your analogy, Larry, earlier about kind of, you know, creating a meal of your for yourself of information, um, finding the different spaces um, that work for you and work for your diet, you know, your news diet, your information diet. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. What, Chuck, you want to add something? Uh, one way you can think about paywalls is look to the news organizations that you like, that give you the strong local news that you enjoy, that also make use of wire services like the Associated Press, like the New York Times, like the Washington Post. And then that way you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting a, a healthy dose of local news and you're getting uh, great national news, news and opinion, uh, all with one subscription fee. And sometimes a site will have multiple wire services, right? And oftentimes that's the case. When it comes to um, broadening out how to use social media to en enrich your news diet, I like to think about it like I think about it as a journalist. There are certain people that I like to follow uh, who helped me become better journalists, who helped me become better thinkers and better writers. And watching what they're up to day in and day out continues to enrich my life. And that's got to be a useful tool for young students as they're beginning their careers and thinking about the world. If they come across a news story and it really matters to them and they really thought it was written well, encourage them to start following that person on whatever social media channel or platform that person normally gravitates towards. And then you start to see who that person reads and who that person retweets. And it, it soon enough, sooner or later, before you know it, you've got a whole list of folks that you're looking at on, on a daily basis. Well, I we're, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. No, I just wanted to say, Chuck, I mean, you, you offer such practical, like helpful advice, but I was just going to say, um, I do that and I love my Twitter feed right now because it's like all of these beautiful writers uh, and I learn journalists and I learn so much and it, like you said who they retweet it then helps me you know it's so it is a great practice so I appreciate you bringing that up. So I, I think this actually uh, leads me to right into the next thing which is you know maybe we can all share some some tips about things that uh, that teachers can do that that they can share with students that you know frankly all of us can do and you know uh, I think it might have been you Rachel in a, in a previous discussion where you said something like you know wait 60 seconds or maybe it was you Liz you know wait 60 seconds before you uh, tweet out something or make sure you read that story before you tweet it out or share it on Facebook or whatever you know don't just read the headline are there other things that we can do as news consumer as individual news consumers to help others, you know, be better informed. And so we're not inadvertently sending them down a rabbit hole of misinformation or, or disinformation. Yeah, um, I'll just echo that, that concept of verify before you share. Um, take a second, take a minute to make sure that what you are about to share is uh, legitimate. It comes from a legitimate uh, standards-based source. And um, if you're not sure, then take, you know, two minutes to do a quick uh, Google search on, on the subject. Um, Google is really, really easy to use and you can, it doesn't take very long. Um, I think that's a huge thing, especially when you're gonna post something on social media, or even if you're just gonna share it with a friend like over text, um, because they might share it and then that information is out there again. Um, I also just want to quickly plug something. Um, so we have a platform at the News Literacy Project called News Lit Nation. This is our educator platform. It's built exclusively for educators. So if you are an educator and you are looking for tools, for resources, to share with your students, um, please go check it out. It's at newslit.org and it's a great resource and it's all free. Thank you so much. Hey, I just wanted to, uh, to thank our uh, sponsor again uh, tonight, the Colorado Education Association for, for making this all uh, possible. I also wanna tell you this is important. Uh, we've got some resources to share with you uh, at coloradosun.com slash newslit. Uh, we've recorded tonight's panel, so if you missed any part of it, uh, you can go back and see it later. Again, we're going to have uh, two more um, uh, events as part of this news literacy series. 
uh, on April 26th from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, we will also have a third event on March 25th. Uh, hope that you will uh, register for those. And you know, tonight's conversation is not uh, the end of the conversation. I hope it's the beginning of a conversation of, and a, the beginning of a journey for you. You might have more questions for us. And uh, in fact, I, there were more questions uh, than, than we were able to get to tonight. I really appreciate uh, all the terrific questions uh, that we had. Um, I want to uh, thank our panelists again, uh, Dr. Rachel Lieberman, Liz Price from the News Literacy Project, uh, Chuck Plunkett. And uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, come, uh, come check out coloradosun.com. I'll just put in a quick plug for us. And, you know, we're, we're a public benefit corporation. We are nonpartisan, we're independent, we're locally owned, um, but you know, we're, we're human. And um, if you think that uh, we didn't get it right, or we were, you know, in the pocket of the left or in the pocket of the right, or, you know, whatever it was, if there's something that's on your mind, I'm easy to reach. I'm Larry at coloradosun.com and uh, love to hear from you. I try to uh, get back to readers who express concerns. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you all again and uh, have a good night.